Good morning. I'm a senior graphic editor at National Geographic, specifically tasked to provide uh, map support to the magazine, uh, doing visual journalism with maps. I want to take you on a journey that looks at the evolution of map design. We recently finished a, a project to archive 130 years of maps, uh, something that hadn't been done uh, before this year. And we came up with 6,600 maps that have been created, and that grows with every issue. Um, it gave us a, a chance to analyze had in different eras. This is the very first map to appear in National Geographic, and it's four meteorological charts that show the path of the Great Storm, one of the first really big hurricanes to hit the east coast of the United States. Uh, it happened in March of 1888. Um, from this earliest issue, editors wanted to kind of illustrate the nature uh, and uh, processes that govern our planet and to make them accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, the job of a cartographic journalist is to take the complex and make it simple. The map showed the violence and duration of the storm using data collected by the U.S. Army Signal Corps, the uh, predecessor to the National Weather Service. And each map showed a different period of time and charted barometric pressure with solid lines and uh, temperature as dotted. They were an in displayed alongside an in-depth dive into what caused the storm and the effects it had on the country. Nearly everyone at some point has hung a National Geographic map on their wall. For a lot of children, this is an introduction to, to geography. We have a reputation for beautiful yet informative wall maps. And uh, from 1922, this is the very first one, uh, we started to produce one or two uh, every other year. Um, this is based on the Vandergritten 4 projection that was patented in 1904. And, uh, this bucked the trend of using Mercator. So National Geographic was in the, the same game, trying to uh, give a more accurate appearance of the world. For collection um, anchored by the series of, of world maps. And this one from 1957 was the first time we introduced bathymetric tints to show the ocean depths. On the eve of Pearl Harbor, we produced this azimuthal equal area projection, um, showing both, hem world, both hemispheres in circles. Um, there was always a quest to find a better projection, a better way to take the Earth and put it on a sheet of paper. Um, by this time, we were also starting to add thematic elements, uh, time zones, population density, land cover, to give a broader sense of what the world contains. This is the very first computer-generated supplement. It was the largest that has ever been put in the magazine. Um, it measured 43 inches by 31 inches and uh, was twice the size of anything that had been released previously. It was included in 11 million copies of the magazine and consumed nearly 2 million pounds of paper and 50,000 pounds of ink. And today we've settled on the Winkle Triple as a compromise. It shows the world in a way that is recognizable um, and uh, accessible, and it answers some of the problems with labeling in Europe and uh, narrow areas in the northern, hemisphere, northern latitudes. We also have an extensive collection of extraterrestrial maps. This is one of my areas of specialty. Um, this map was issued um, in February 1969, and it used the then very new photography that was taken to prepare for the Apollo missions that have their 50th anniversary this year. We're hoping that we can do an update this year using the latest lunar reconnaissance, lunar reconnaissance orbiter data uh, to give us a refresh. Um, as a note, this map was so well received that NASA actually used it 
four years as their primary reference for the moon. Uh, the relief was painted by Tiber Toth, um, looking at individual photos and uh, compositing them together. And I created this map in 2016. Uh, it's to go along with a special TV series, Mars. Um, this uses the latest Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter data uh, overlaid with place names uh, that have been approved from USGS. Uh, USGS actually has a database of all the extraterrestrial names in the solar system. They are the, the clearinghouse for that. Um, so it was an exciting project to work on. The MAPS division was born in 1915. Prior to that time, MAPS were picked up from journals or from the, uh, the article author. Um, but as we started to include broader topics beyond weather and natural processes, uh, a MAPS division was needed. And uh, the first chief cartographer was Albert Holt Holmes Bumstead, and he started to make his mark. He was a society's uh, first champion for that, that division. And he set the stage for uh, many more beautiful maps to come. He uh, would actually go on to invent compasses and uh, most of the typefaces that we use on our maps that make them iconic um, that we still use today. And he even has a mountain named after him on Antarctica. It's Mount Bumstead. What followed was arguably the most celebrated collection of relief maps in car the cartography world has seen. This one was done by Bigginzoli and Kelly in 1962 and shows an expedition route through, the, through Nepal. During the 1960s, Heinrich Caesar Baran started to make his mark in the world uh, with a splendid mix of art and cartography. He was famous for stunning panoramas. National Geographic readers were treated to a master class in train mapping over the following years. And without a doubt, the 1960s and 70s were a golden era in train mapping. This is another classic Braun. It's a panorama. It introduced his iconic signature in the bottom, left, bottom right corner. While his work was unique, he wasn't the only one who was a shining light in this space. Uh, others were crafting spectacular pieces of work, like this classic Washburn map of the Grand Canyon from 1978. And another notable project during that time was uh, this effort to map Everest. It had contributions from the government of Nepal, the Survey of China, and Swiss Topo, and it took four years combining high resolution camera data from the Columbia Space Shuttle and 160 overlapping aerial images that mapped um, the, the area at 40,000 feet. It covers 380 square miles. There were a few relief artists that were on staff uh, in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, two of them, Bob Pratt, who created the map on the left, and Tiber Toth, who did a lot of the relief work that we um, use up until recently. He uh, created most of the, the plate work in the National Geographic Atlas of the World, him and uh, John Bonner, another artist. Our love of terrain visualiz visualizations didn't just stay on land. We also um, created stunning panoramas of uh, the ocean surface, oh, I'm sorry, under, sea, under the um, ocean crust. And we had a, a series of those published in 1967. It was based on the bathymetric studies of Marie Tharp and Bruce Heason. Their work, along with our ocean map series, contributed greatly today's, to today's understanding of seafloor sea floor spreading. I say that three times. Continental drift and plate tectonics. While much of our focus in the time was on smaller scale mapping, it was the built up environment that caught the attention of storytellers in the 1930s. The first medium scale map featured in the magazine was of Southern California. 
The map's titled Southern California, an area twice the size of Portugal, with Los Angeles being larger than the island of Martinique. We were still new at getting things simple in those days. <laughs> Already, we can see that uh, that style of signature curve text that has become uh, iconic of National Geographic was in use, um, using expanding curves to label tight areas. The first large-scale format city map was, of course, of Washington, D.C., our backyard. This pocket map was sent to subscribers in 1948, and it still featured many of the temporary structures that were built to help win World War II. Throughout the pages of the magazine, we continued to explore methods for visualizing urban landscapes. This wonderful pictorial representation is of historical Williamsburg, uh, just up the, up the road. And this incredibly detailed view of the islands of Paris was drawn by Snezhinka Stefanov and was featured in 1968. These hand-drawn illustrated 3D maps were quite trendy at the time. Now, jumping forward, more recently our attention was focused on the heartbeat and threats facing our urban environments. This map by Martin Gamache plots population loss over the last five decades throughout Detroit. At the turn of the 21st century, the focus throughout much of National Geographic's 103-year cartograph, 103 cartographic history had been the depiction of physical and political forms. In the 2000s, Chief Cartographer Alan Carroll introduced a new feature called Cartographic. It was a monthly dive into complex and fascinating geodata visualizations. So we continued that to this day, combining thematic data and uh, accurate geography to tell a story. This is one of the first. Um, it, it's from 1981. It's a simple but powerful thematic map it illustrates the value and abundance of silver across the world by using pictorial bars of silver to represent producers and consumers. And this map from 1989 charts the riches of the cocaine industry, flowing from South America to Africa and North America. The stacked columns indicate quantity of illicit cocaine seized by U.S. Drug Enforcement authorities. The the map also features two charts showing the number of cocaine users at high schools and households across America. It became commonplace in the 80s and 90s and continues to today to combine maps, graphics, and uh, all that to support magazine stories. We also have used an abundance of cartograms. This one is by John Tamanio, who's our current director of graphics. And it dives into um, how each country uh, impacts Earth's resources. This cartogram uh, shows countries size according to the GDP. Black dots show GDP in 1980, and lighter dots show their growth since then. Each dot represents 20 billion. A country's color indicates its GDP per person. And then we come to the 80s. <laughs> they were all about the movies, and the clothes, and the music, and big hair. And some of these trends clearly rubbed off on the cartographers at the time. Um, here are a, bold, a few bold and brash maps that were synonymous of that style. Um, bright colors, and you notice the, the flags featured prominently. To today, our maps continue to support the magazine in its efforts to do good journalism. Our work is a unique fusion of reference and thematic. Sitting at the cutting edge of visual journalism, art, science, and design, we continue to cover important issues both locally and abroad, working with scientists, explorers, authors, and photographers to tell the best stories possible through cartography. Here are some representatives uh, of today's work. Um, this one is from October 2014, and former staffer Jenny Mason told the story of California's water crisis, and this was a top prize winner. These are two represent, representatives of our modern magazine style in terms of palette, topography, and arrangement and editorial flavor. Uh, on the left is land distribution in uh, Scotland by former staffer Lauren James. 
And on the right is a map I created to show citizen created and encouraged marine parks in Mexico. As population in China continues to grow, and as that population becomes wealthier and starts to take on a more Western level of consumption, the challenge of feeding its 1.2 billion people will stress both the world economy and its internal distribution of arable land. Here I combined arable land with population density to show where there's an overlap and conflict. And I uh, worked with uh, another senior graphic editor, Manuel Canales, to bring in some statistical data on calorie consumption and how uh, China has uh, sprung up in the last decade. This was an important uh, tent pole of this year. National Geographic wants to call attention to the perils of single-use plastic. And this map was a, a gatefold featured in the magazine created by staffers Jason Treat and Ted Sickley to bring attention to this. And this will appear in the November issue. Um, the Ilsu Dam in uh, Turkey is a, an effort that that country is doing to um, dam up the river, which is a lifeline to Syria and Iraq beneath. Um, a lot of times we combine maps with text to weave it into the narrative. And staffer uh, Ryan Morris did a really great job of that here. Now, when the map is the story, this year's redesign of the magazine uh, brought about a section called Atlas, which is a, uh, a, a story that is rooted in the cartography. The map is the story. And so uh, we have a, an abundance of, uh, of latitude to, to cover topics. For example, this is the first ever map in National Geographic of Pluto. Uh, recently, the names were approved by the body that, that covers them. And uh, it, it, each planet in our solar system gets a, a theme. And so we played on that and had some uh, illustration to go along with it. And on the, the right is uh, what I like to call hypothetical cartography. It's what will happen in 250 million years. Uh, a new supercontinent uh, will form called Pangaea Proxima. And the inestimable Charles Pepernell created the relief for this. Uh, two more examples. On the left is uh, a piece done by Lauren James detailing a coral crisis that's forming off the coast of Australia. Um, between 2016 and 17, over 70% of the coral bleached. That's a, a, a damage that will take generations to, to repair. And it calls attention to the warming that's happening across the globe. And I had the, the privilege to report on the Everglades to talk about how between Miami's increased water use and the encroachment of sea level rise, by 2100, that region could be totally unrecognizable. And that brings me to the end here, we are looking for data. We would love to feature your data in the magazine. So if you have an interesting data set that uh, could be done on a regional level, send it my way and we'll take a look at it and try to, uh, to see if it's something we can feature. But uh, thank you. I think we can take one question. Have time for that? Please, in this case. Uh, that was awesome. I love that talk. Thank you for it. Um, I'm wondering if, while you were looking at all these old maps and sort of the progression of the style, if you were able to look at all sort of the techniques of like methodology for making them, if anything surprised you about how a certain map was made? Well, uh, in the era of Bumstead and all, everything was hand drawn. And uh, we have a lot of history at, at the society, so there, that's um, recorded. Um, just amazing the, the ways they do, used to do type. It was, everything was on a roll and you would stick it onto the map. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're going to be sharing this archive at some point. We're trying to work out the rights so that we can make it a, a, available publicly. But um, it, it's been get old techniques and kind of pull from that. Okay, once again, thank you to Matt.